Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. On Staten Island, New York, in January, Mrs. D. Daly was driving late at night and had to swerve to avoid a hairy humanoid less than six feet tall that was crossing the road from the church car park and heading for the rubbish dump and swamp behind the church. It was a bipedal creature covered with long black hair. The creature was five foot eight inches tall to five foot ten inches tall with a neckless head and arms that, that swung slightly in front of its body. Two four-toed footprints that were 10 inches long were found in the snow the next morning. On to the next one. In Richmond Town on Staten Island, New York, a young couple saw a Bigfoot in a church car park early in the morning. At Watertown in Jefferson County in New York, Steve Rich, 11, Larry Emerson, 11, and another boy saw Bigfoot, about five feet tall, walking along the edge of the forest. The creature was swinging its arms while it walked, and the boys saw it on State Street Hill in Watertown. On to the next one. Near Sarnac Lake, Clinton County, New York, in June, two men in a car saw Bigfoot squatting on the side of the road, and as they came closer, it got up on two legs and walked away. On to the next one. In Chattahooga County, in New York, I live in the western park of New York State. My story concerns a hunting camp that I belong to that is approximately 65 miles southwest of Buffalo, New York, and approximately 25 miles northeast of Erie, Pennsylvania. The area is considered rural with second growth forests. My story concerns four separate incidents over a 25 year span. Taken separately, you can probably explain them away, but Taken collectively, it leads me to believe there may be more to it. My uncle, cousin, and I were at the hunting camp. I do not recall the exact time of year, but it was either late summer or early fall. Late one evening, perhaps 10 or 11 p.m., we heard a very strange, powerful call. My uncle, who was an excellent outdoorsman, could not identify the call. To me, it sounded like a cross between a bird of some sort and a bobcat. As we listened, the animal was moving through the backwoods. After a while, my uncle decided that he wanted to locate the animal making the noise. The area in question is sandwiched between a large swamp that is very, very difficult to walk through and a 50-acre lake. This area becomes increasingly narrower and an animal would most likely pass through a narrow tract of land approximately 200 yards wide before crossing a road. So he, my cousin, and I headed out into the night. My uncle took us to a field that sits next to the narrow tract here and waited. The animal was getting closer. It was maybe a 100 yards away. It stopped calling. We could not see it, nor do I believe could it see us. We waited for some time, but it never called again, and it did not cross the road. There were three witnesses, my uncle, cousin, and me. The sighting was at 10 or 11. The weather conditions, I can only recall if it was raining or not. The area was pine and hardwood, second growth forest with a large pond and swamp. I almost forgot about this incident until very recently. Fast forward a few years. 
my uncle, while out hunting in the same area as before, claims he had seen a Bigfoot. As he relayed the story, I could tell he was visibly agitated and quite forceful in his conversation in what he had seen. Now, I must tell you a couple of things about my uncle. First of all, he died a few years ago, so unfortunately, I cannot question him further. But he was an excellent outdoorsman. He had hunted small and big game all along the eastern part of North America. When he was younger, he would go to Ontario every spring and fall near James Bay to hunt bear and moose. I would say he was very familiar with bear and their habitat, so I'm sure it was not a bear he had seen. But he also liked to drink whiskey and beer. So when he told us he had seen a Bigfoot, I'm sure all of us, including me, thought he must have been hallucinating. However, as I think back about my uncle, even when he was quite drunk, I had never known him to make up stories. He certainly liked to retell his stories over and over, but they were always factual and did not vary in detail. In the fall, a couple years later, my brother-in-law told me, while cutting firewood in the same area, he had seen something very large. He did not get a good look at it because it frightened him so much. He hopped on his four-wheeler and left the area immediately. At the time, my brother-in-law did not know of my uncle's Bigfoot story, so I was quite intrigued. I asked him questions as the size and color, but he could only say that it was very large and black in color. I did not follow up to investigate the area because some time had passed since the incident, and he had gone back into the same area without seeing anything unusual. A few months ago, I went online and played some Bigfoot vocalizations. As I played one of the recordings, I almost fell out of my chair. It was the same vocalization I had heard approximately 25 years ago. The sight and sounds of that night so long ago came back to me in a flash. It was this last incident that captured my interest and convinced me to tell my story. I must admit, I do have some issues with the possibility of a Sasquatch living in the area. There has never been, to my knowledge, any other sightings in the area. However, there have been a number of incidents south of the area in Pennsylvania and one incident in the next county to the east. Number two, the area in question, although rural, seems a bit too populated for one or more animals to avoid detection. Even when an occasional bear wanders through, it always seems to get spotted from time to time. Number three, I too have hunted and hiked over the same area many times in the past 30 years and have never seen anything to suggest a large creature is living in the area. Number four, the area supports a large deer population, but I have never come across a deer kill in the manner described Bigfoot to kill them. To be fair, although I raised the issue, I've never actively looked for signs of Sasquatch. On to the next one. Whitehall Police Sergeant Wilfred Gosling and his brother, Russell, heard an eerie, high-pitched scream for one minute while they were hunting at the intersection of Abir Road and Route 22A in Whitehall. It was not an animal that they recognized. On to the next one. Two boys in Watertown in Jefferson County in New York saw an eight-foot-tall Bigfoot covered in black hair. Fifteen-inch tracks were later found. Later in Watertown, in Jefferson County, in New York, a hairy humanoid was seen by Dennis Smith and Kimmy Slate. The creature was eight feet tall, black and hair-covered, and was seen at sunrise. Minutes later, they saw it again walking through a field. A state trooper saw a large, hairy, ape-like figure 75 to 100 yards away in a field near a bare road. The creature had pink eyes. The creature made a loud scream like a pig's squeal or a woman's scream. 
on to the next one. In Washington County, in New York, in August, a hairy humanoid was seen. Marty Paddock, Bart Kinney, and Paul Gosling saw the creature three times that day. Initially, it was only Marty and Paul who saw the beast in a field near Abir Road at around 10 p.m. Originally, it was standing on the side of the road. The creature was human-looking, and the two boys went to the end of the road and turned back. They stopped and heard a noise like a pig squealing or a lady screaming. They drove off to the top of a hill, locked the doors on the truck, loaded the gun, and pointed it out of the window. They drove back to the opposite side of the road to get a better shot at it. At first, they did not see it, but eventually they saw it standing near a telephone pole about 70 feet away. It began running toward their truck, and they slammed the truck into gear and burned about 57 feet of tire rubber down the road. They went to the Whitehall police, but no one would believe them there, even though Paul was the son of a policeman. He was off duty at the time. Both of the men then went and got their friend, Bart Kinney, who told them about the sighting, and they all drove back to the spot where it was still standing. It had big red eyes and just stood there without moving, and was seven to eight feet tall and 300 to 400 pounds in weight. Thick, short, brown, coarse hair covered it, with the head hair being longer. They returned to the Whitehall Police Station and reported it again. The police contacted the state police and the sheriff's patrol. Gosling's father, Wilbur, joined the group, and they walked into the field where the monster had been and heard a frightening scream. A sheriff shone a spotlight into the field and saw something walking along a fence. On to the next one. This was in Columbiana County in Ohio. I am a photographer who lives in Northeast Ohio. A few years ago, while I was out with my camera one afternoon, I heard what I thought were Bigfoot howls or moans in Beaver Creek State Park. Sometime later, I heard them again in the very same place. The reason I have not reported this before is because I do not want to be laughed at or thought to be crazy. In April, while I was walking in the park again, I started up a hill and was overcome with the sense of being watched. As I walked out of the park, I had noticed there were no other people located in my vicinity. I also noticed the spider webs were still across the trail, so no one had been there before me that morning. I have been in this part of the park for 10 or more years, and it is very quiet. No noise. It was late afternoon. On to the next one. In Adams County in Ohio at midday in November, two hunters using bows and arrows observed what appeared to be a large, dark figure walking or running across a field. The creature traversed the area at an astonishing speed. At other times, strange yelping sounds have been heard in the area. On to the next one. In Jefferson County, in Ohio, near Wintersville, and a quarter of a mile from U.S. Route 22, in a wooded area near our home. My grandson was squirrel hunting with his grandfather, who had left him to sit on a log and moved to another area. He was 12 years old at the time. He saw a dark, hairy figure run out from behind a tree. He said it was bigger than a person. It ran upright and ran very fast. He said it made a noise that reminded him of a high-pitched chainsaw. He also said that its feet made a lot of noise thumping on the ground as it ran. He could hardly believe what he was seeing after it disappeared out of sight. And he ran and found his grandfather and told him what he had seen, but his grandfather didn't believe him. Another time, he was playing in the woods and he heard strange noises, like someone striking a tree with something. He heard these sounds from three separate locations. He picked up a stick 
and started striking a tree himself, and the noises stopped. I myself heard the same noise in the woods behind our house. My grandson was sitting on a log watching for a squirrel when he heard the noises he was playing in the woods. When I heard the noises, I was standing in my backyard. My grandson has heard the knocking noises several times in the woods, both before the sighting and after it. I heard the knocking noises in the fall. I heard these noises coming from two different locations, and the only explanation I could think of at the time was that someone was in the wood building a tree stand for deer hunting. These incidents occurred in a forested area behind our house. We live on a ridge, and there is a creek at the bottom of the hill, and a hill going up to another ridge on the other side of the creek. The area is heavily forested, but has been logged recently. It is not a particularly remote area, though the woods probably go for a few miles without any houses. On to the next one. Near Youngstown in Thrumble County, Ohio. Late in the evening, I was pulling my car around the apartment complex when I saw what I thought was a bear. The next day, after seeing the tracks near the garbage dumpster area, I was convinced it was a Bigfoot. I called the police to show them the footprints, and the police laughed at me. I took pictures of them because we had a light snowfall the day before. My father, who is from the West Virginia mountains and knows animal tracks, said the tracks couldn't be bears because of the way the prints were deeper in the front and so far apart. As long as eight feet apart, he said, at one point, my father said it looked like it was reaching for something. The police said that years ago there was a bear in the area, but what I saw the night before and what I saw the next morning was not anything close to a bear. But I will say I felt at peace when I saw him the night before. I wasn't frightened at all. Its face wasn't scary. It was more like a lost and lonely puppy. For years, Many people in the apartment building and police department made fun of me, but I know what I saw, and for being the biggest coward around, I honestly wasn't scared. It was a cold night. The lighting was good, and there was snow on the ground. I don't even have my headlights on. He was just standing on the edge of the woods near the trash bin and then moved back slowly while looking at me with a sincere look of friendship. I looked for him many times after that, and never saw him again. The time had to be around 8 p.m. since I got off work at 7.30 p.m. Quiet area, there's a small river and a wooded area that stretches out for miles behind the apartment. More further back is a train track that also stretches for miles. I read on another Bigfoot website that there was a Bigfoot scream heard for miles just a year or two before I saw it. I called the landlord that night. He saw nothing until the next morning, when everyone saw the tracks. I also read where he was seen behind a waterfall up the road from where I saw him. On to the next one. This sighting occurred at around 10 p.m. at night. We live in a very rural area of Adams County, Ohio. We have a house on 60 very wooded acres. My wife was sitting and watching TV, as we were all. We have a back window near the TV some 10 feet away from where we sit. My wife suddenly said that there were two eyes staring at her through the window. I first thought she was joking, but she wasn't. I got up and went to the window, which was closed. As it was cold and opened the window and could not hear or see anything, but it was dark. About the same time as my wife said she saw the eyes, my oldest son was getting up to go outside on our front screen deck porch. As I was at the window, my son had just gone out the sliding glass door to the porch and was lighting a cigarette. As I turned away from the window, my son opened the door and was yelling for me as he was pointing out the porch to the separate garage building that is next to our house. He dropped his cigarette and stood there looking for a few seconds and then quickly came into the house saying he had just seen a big hairy thing looking around the corner of the garage in his direction. This got all of us excited and somewhat scared. 
I had just had a knee operation, so I did not go outside to investigate. I did, however, get a gun and load it. I went onto the porch, but did not hear or see anything. I was convinced that my wife and son had seen the same thing, as it could have walked across the back of the house and garage and come around the corner within that time. My wife described the eyes as very close together and a glowing green color and larger than a human's eyes. My son described the creature as being very dark in color, with the hair very long and hanging down over its face. He couldn't make out any facial features. Our deck and porch is some four feet raised off the ground, with the garage on the ground. Based on my son's description of the height of the head in relation to the basketball hoop that was in the front of the garage, the thing was in the seven to eight foot tall range. The next day, I went out looking for any sign. I found nothing at the window or behind the house and garage area at the corner. I walked across a grass field that extends out from the side of the garage and did find what appeared to be a faint impression of a very large foot in a hard clay sand non-grassy spot. I measured and copied the imprint the best I could. I do remember it being some 16 inches in length and some 10 to 12 inches in width across the top. The impression was made along the weight-bearing area with a large arch area that left no impression. The toes appeared to be small, with all leaving the same type of impression. The sighting occurred in late December, around 10 p.m. at night. I also, a year or so before the sighting, being on the rear deck porch of our master bedroom, also later at night heard a strange howling sound far off in the distance sounding like it was near the top of the ridge some quarter of a mile up the hill behind our house. I don't think it was a coyote or a dog. The two witnesses, my wife and son, I saw the footprint impression the next day and I heard the howling noise. My wife and son were watching TV in our living room. I mentioned it to the neighbors, but they never did say anything. It was a good weather night and cold, but above freezing, it is a very wooded and hilly terrain. On to the next one. In Coshton County in Ohio, I was told about a Bigfoot being spotted in Woodbury game land. So I've been studying the area since then. The very first time out there, I found a three-toed footprint about 14 inches long and about six inches wide. At another time out there, I found a tree along a dirt road that had a top branch broken and twisted at the same time. This break occurred at eight feet above the ground. A person could not have done this because the top of the tree would not have been able to support any kind of weight due to the smallness of the branches. That same day, about a mile away in a field, I found all types of bones spread about in a 20-foot diameter. The strangest thing that I found, though, was that two freshly killed beaver remains were stacked on top of each other like something ate one and then ate the other one and placed it on top of the first one, tail on top of tail, bones on top of bones, in the same direction. I still search this area at this time, trying to get evidence that Sasquatch is alive and well. It is always too quiet out in the woods, not much animal sound like birds chirping and so on. I found this stuff in the morning on a clear spring day. I've heard that there has been several video footage of Bigfoot in the area. I also heard this call one day out in the woods, within a mile or so. It was like a, ooh, ooh, for about half a minute. I have never heard this in my life before. The tree marker was on a dirt road that runs through the valley of an old strip mine surrounded by woods on either side. The animal remains were found in the middle of a field about a hundred yards wide, and about two miles long. On to the next one. In Park County in Indiana, we were then living in Ohio. My husband had photography work to do and was being transferred to Indiana. In the fall, while driving south on Highway 41 near Turkey Run State Park in Indiana, my husband and I saw what we affectionately called a something. 
It was a misty night and we were headed for Terre Haute. I was driving my Ford Aerostar van with my husband in the passenger seat. I was glad he was on that side. We also had our two-year-old son in the back seat. It was walking in the gully. It stood taller than the van, so to speculate on the height, I would say it was over six feet tall easily. The body was black and hairy, although the face was huge and long in the jaw, shaped like a knight of a chess piece, but not like a horse. My husband describes the face more like a lion's shape. We passed it and continued our trip, and later even moved here with our child going to Turkey Run School. We traveled the same road often from Turkey Run to Rockville and have never seen it again. Yet the hairs on the back of our necks were raised. We were asking each other, do you see that? Do you see that? Then we described to each other what we saw. It was close to 11 to 12, dark with misty rain, no street light, only our headlight. It was walking the same direction, so we came upon it from behind. We used our peripheral vision to look. We were too scared to really take a gander. It is forest area hilly and not very populated. There is a bridge nearby. My brother claims to have seen one, but he travels a lot. He's a wilderness kind of guy. My nephew, who is in the Marines, thinks we saw a buffalo or a bison, but there were no horns, and this was not a four-legged creature. On to the next one. I'm a deer hunter, and have been hunting these woods for more than five years. This happened in Fountain County in Indiana. I use the same tree stand every time. I know every nuance of the area. What I'm trying to say is I was at the height of my senses and nothing was getting by me. I was standing in my tree stand with my right hand holding my 12 gauge rifled barrel shotgun when the creature let me know he had been watching me. I had been in the stand about two hours. The sound was the deepest, evil-sounding voice I had ever heard. It started like a demon taking deep breaths. This really shook me up. Its voice seemed amplified in comparison to anything else I have ever heard. After the two deep exhales, it started to snort and bellow unlike anything I had ever heard before. My eyes never moved. I watched the direction in which the sound was coming from, but it was getting dark in the woods, so I couldn't see very deep in the woods, but I did catch a glimpse of shadow or something about seven to nine feet tall, standing upright, moving swiftly. It was at this time my safety went off and I drew my weapon on movement. I tried to scope in whatever was out there. Once I was looking through my scope, it bellowed even louder. I still couldn't get a clear fix on anything, and I'm not the type of hunter that fires without confirmation of a target, even though I was extremely scared. Never in my life have I been scared in the woods, especially when I'm holding such a powerful weapon. It was at this time it tore out of there, sounding like I was right next to a Clydesdale, over a 400-pound animal. Whatever it was, I have been too scared to go and see if there were any tracks, but I plan to check sometime this week. What is really amazing is how something so big got right up next to me within 25 yards, and I never heard it coming. But when it left, it was louder than a freight train. If it was trying to communicate with me, it said everything really well, vocalizing right at me and making it known that this was its territory. Twenty minutes after it left, I heard what seemed only a half a mile away the same sound, but it was also thrashing a tree. I heard it fall. I was standing in a tree stand, motionless, downwind from where the creature approached. Also, I was in camouflage except for an orange hat. It was approximately 5.50 p.m., if you have ever been in Indiana woods, it is full of hills and valleys with small creek beds everywhere. 
The area was a patch of woods next to some harvested bean fields. The terrain is sloped up toward the south of my position, and it was in that direction I made the hearing and glimpse. Leaves were off the trees, and the underbrush is somewhat thick. On to the next one. At Huntington's Reservoir State Park, east of I-69, near Markle, in Huntington County, in Indiana. It was in the winter, shotgun season for deer. I had gotten into the woods half an hour before sunrise. I decided to sit up against a tree in a little ravine. I was facing east toward a half-destroyed bridge. I sat there for a few, and I nodded off. I heard a twig snap. I slowly raised my head, thinking it was a deer, but instead there was something walking along a trail that goes to the washout bridge. At my guess, it seemed to be at least nine feet tall, I say. I was about a hundred yards away. I saw an outline figure very well. I just froze, got goosebumps all over, and the back of my hair stood up. It had a very long stride walk and slumped over as it walked. When it approached the bridge, it didn't miss a step when it got across. I've been on that bridge, and I know I have to jump across, and I still wouldn't make it across. When it disappeared, I thought it was another hunter, so I just let it go, until I got to my truck and I realized that I was the only hunter there, and that the figure I saw wasn't wearing any hunter orange, during shotgun season. That's when it hit me. After about 10 minutes or so, the squirrels were active and the birds were making noises as they do first thing in the morning. I had a similar incident a few years later, about 200 yards away from the first sighting, but instead hearing a loud squealing noise this time. I knew what it was as I saw a documentary on Discovery and I just packed up my gear and I was off. It was morning, I say between the hours of 5 or 6 a.m. The sighting was by a creek. The creature was walking on a trail near a fence rail. On to the next one. Near Bedford, south of Brown County in the Hoosier National Forest in Indiana, while backpacking near the horse trails and access point in the county below Brown County, I experienced a confrontation with a bipedal primate. It was early March, and I was alone. Around 7 o'clock in the evening, after hiking several miles, I set up camp in a wooded area about 100 yards from the horse trail. Darkness was descending quickly, so I was in a rush to set up camp and prepare my supper. After gathering firewood, and getting my fire started for light and cooking, I suddenly began hearing leaves and brush rustling below me and to the east along a ravine that I camped above. At that moment, I thought to myself that it was a bit early for mushroom hunters and probably too dark for them to see any. Perhaps it's a deer. Anyway, I grabbed my knife for protection and grabbed the flashlight and cautiously approached the ravine where the noises were coming from. I yelled out in the direction of the sound and aimed my flashlight and to my astonishment viewed a very tall, upright, human-looking being hiding behind a clump of trees close to the stream. The creature stood about seven feet tall as I could see his silhouette from the left side of the trees. He was leaning forward and exposing his head to view me. He or it was approximately 40 feet from my position, and the light from my flashlight shined into its eyes. I could see that he had dark hair covering his conical-shaped head and dark eyes in front of his skull. I knew immediately that this couldn't be a man. I was very frightened and yelled out again in hopes of scaring him off. He ran into the scream and away from me about six feet before ducking behind another tree. I continued to follow him with my flashlight and screaming at him with threat. This went on for two or three minutes before he took off running down the creek out of sight. 
The rest of the night, I stayed awake near my campfire, fearing for a return visit and waiting for daylight to return to my truck. I would have packed out that night, only my truck was in a direction that the hairy biped fled, and I was miles in. This entire situation was very frightening to me because I always thought that if Bigfoot existed, it would be in the Cascades or the Canadian Rockies. At first light, I examined the site where the biped was near the stream, and besides some turned over leaves, I saw no prints, and the stream appeared normal. At the time, I was cooking a pork steak on a stick over my campfire. It is hilly, deciduous forest, few conifers, sandstone, and bedrock bluff exposed clay creek bed. On to the next one. I'm an official living and working in Southern Oregon, even today. And yes, when I retire soon, I can say that I will most definitely be doing some more research on Bigfoot because I saw one take down a deer in the late spring of 2001. Here is my Bigfoot encounter story. With everything going on in the world in 2001, my part of the world grew bigger and more mysterious. While responding to a call in the middle of nowhere, for lack of a better term, I watched as a literal Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, take down and literally kill a deer. It was a brief sighting. It lasted probably no longer than two minutes. However, that, I suppose, is longer than most people's sightings of road crossings and tree peaks. I live in the southern Oregon region of the Pacific Northwest. I was not born here but I went to college up north and ended up loving Oregon and decided to settle down here for good. After graduation, I got a job in law enforcement and moved to Southern Oregon. Today, I'm nearing retirement, and when I do, I will have no issues with sharing my encounter without the anonymity. For now, however, I will keep my face and name to myself, but I have to share this with you. Anyway, here is what happened that day and what led up to it. I was not actually on patrol that day. I was simply responding to a complaint, possible crime up between Willow Lake and Lake of the Woods. There is a highway there that runs between them. Oh, before I tell you everything that happened that morning, I have to say I am currently on my own, researching more and more about this subject and learning a ton. And while there is a ton of stories and information out here about Bigfoot, personally speaking, I think that only a small percentage of it is actually true, but that is my opinion. And no, before this incident, I was not a confirmed believer. I had heard the stories and even came across some interesting old reports here in Southern Oregon that were hard to explain, but no, I was not a true believer even then. So with that, here is my own story and how I became a true believer today. On a side road off of Scotch Road between Fish Lake, Lake of the Woods, and Willow Lake in Oregon, there were some litter bugs making a mess in the woods. Of course, just in case of any foul play or other craziness, not to mention the crime itself, at least three law enforcement agencies would look at and investigate the area. I was one of them. Actually, I was the second to investigate. I knew the day before that I would be heading up there rather early, and I knew that after that, I would have the rest of the day and weekend off. So, in light of those facts, I decided I would take myself a lunch and have it up there after I did my investigation. That decision would change my life for good and forever. I reached the scene around 7 a.m. and got to work wandering around the area with a camera, taking some photos, and even checking out the outer area for possible evidence, like footprints, tire tracks, and so on. I won't tell you what else we do. That way it keeps you guessing, and hopefully from littering up there, because we will catch you, huh? Anyway, back to the sighting. It took a couple of hours, but by 9 a.m. I was almost done collecting all the evidence and information I needed. I would question the witnesses who found it the next day in town. For now, though, I was going to enjoy the rest of the morning 
up in the mountain. I left the scene and headed back to town, but not before stopping off about five miles down the road to a favorite little spot I like to visit from time to time. There's a turnoff. Well, a little dirt road, more like it, just off the main road between the two lakes that acts like a turnaround when you pull off into it. From there, you can see down into a small ravine where a creek literally runs through it and a large hillside climbs up the sky on the other side of the road. It was here that I pulled over, grabbed my thermos and my pail with my sandwich and some sweets in it. I decided I would lean up against the hood and stare off into the green abyss and enjoy the rest of the morning. Well, that was until I was interrupted by the hunted. It was not loud, but loud enough to hear even from that distance. I turned and looked up the hillside opposite the road I had pulled off on when I heard what sounded like a deer and one in trouble. You know the sound, kind of a skittery bugle sound. I don't know how to describe it. I guess you could say it was making bleats, I suppose is what they call it. About 150 yards up the hillside, give or take 10 yards or so, there was a clearing in the trees, like a small little meadow covered in green tall grass. And of course, some wildflowers that dotted the landscape here and there. At first, I did not see it. But eventually, after a few moments or so, a young buck came out of the tree line and almost into the middle of the open area of the small meadow. I could not make out the content of its rack, but you could tell that it was a decent size, but young buck to be sure. It appeared to move into the open, and then it stood completely still like a statue. Its head was turned toward the southwest, basically higher up the hillside towards a tree line. I could not see a single foot into it. It made that worried sound again, the bleeding sound as it shifted its head around, but that was the only movement that came from it as it made its noise. I leaned up against the hood of my vehicle for a moment, then remembered I had both a high power and low power set of binoculars in the front of the vehicle. So I slowly walked over, opened the door quietly, and grabbed the low power. I thought that was all I needed at the time. As far as I was concerned, I was about to witness, and I was guessing this event at that time, but I thought I was about to witness a predator like a mountain lion or a small pack of coyotes take down a deer. Well, boy, was it a predator. I have heard William Jevning say that when you see a Bigfoot, you find yourself in shock and awe because you simply have no frame of reference for such a creature in your mind, even if you believe they exist. I know what he is saying when this giant, ugly, massive monster of the woods that was now as real as the deer to me came flying out of those dark woods, while shock and awe had me dropping my food and drink. But let me tell you how it went down. It was almost seconds after the deer made it sound for a second time that I heard a couple of knocks. I guess you could call them coming from the direction the deer was looking in. What in the world was that? I literally said that under my breath. What in the world makes knocking sounds out here other than people? For a second, I was glad I had my gun on me. I might be catching a poacher here instead, I thought. The deer stomped its left front leg on the ground all of a sudden and looked as though it was about to bolt. However, it did not take off fast enough. The next thing I knew, I noticed, and with my binoculars on, a massive, tall, dark blur come flying out of those same woods, but from the opposite direction of the knock. It came from the lower part of the open area right out of the tree line, and it was in front of that deer in a split second, which had to be at that moment at least 40 feet away from that tree line. It took only a few steps to get there. It was so fast, so large and massive, that I literally dropped my sandwich and pulled the binoculars away from my eyes to get a better perspective of what I was looking at. Sometimes, by actually looking at the bigger scene, you can pull more important aspects from it. This thing, what I was now understanding could only be a Bigfoot, was literally taking down a deer in front of my eyes. It grabbed the deer by the antlers with one hand and moved swiftly around the other side, or it wrapped its other arm around its neck 
then literally lifted the animal up midair and snap. The deer went lifeless in a split second. Next thing I know, I was lifting the binoculars back up slowly, only to see this dark, black, hairy creature toss the deer down like a dirty rag into a laundry basket. It had to be at least eight feet tall, and later, weeks later, when I got the nerve to walk up there to do a little investigating myself, it had to be that tall, and at least 500 pounds, give or take as well. I could not see much of the face. It was dark, ashen skin, I suppose. The hair was jet black. It was tall and bipedal. I never once saw this thing run or move on all fours like some state. If it does, well, I did not notice that at all. It was broad-shouldered, for sure, and there was what looked to be a neck, but not much of one. The head, I could tell through the binoculars, did in fact have a slight cone shape to it, but not quite a lemon or a football. It dismembered that deer immediately after it dispatched it. It tore off the hind legs I could see, but then, all of a sudden, it crouched down and looked as though it was opening up the chest cavity and pulling innards out. I could not be sure of this, but that is what I guessed as its back was to me at that point. It felt like time was standing still, but all of this happened inside a couple of minutes for sure. It stood up again, and, like it came, it was gone in a flash, heading in the opposite direction it came, and disappeared into the tree line. Amazed, scared, freaked out, and slowly becoming nervous, that was how I was feeling as I slowly dropped the binoculars back down to my chest. I decided it might not be a smart thing to stay there. I started thinking, with the knocks, either there was probably more Bigfoot out here than the one I just observed. I packed it all away, and as I did, I kept those eyes in the back of my head. After about 45 seconds, I was in the vehicle and starting it. I looked up that hill one more time and rolled down my window. At that moment, I swear, over the sound of the engine, I could hear a scream or yelling of sorts coming down off the hillside. I cannot be sure of it, but a faint sound is what I believe I heard. On to the next one. In a deer county in Oklahoma, Thelma West said she put out some stinky garbage when she and another man saw a creature on the porch eating it. The creature had big red eyes, when on all fours, was about five feet high. The man shot at it with a shotgun, and it ran quickly into the woods on its hind legs. On to the next one. In Adair County in Oklahoma, in August, Brian Jones and the two Richie boys saw red eyes looking in at a window. Outside, Brian met a foul-smelling eight-foot-tall Bigfoot, which lifted him off the ground and then dropped him and ran off when the other two people appeared. The witnesses shot at the Bigfoot, who retaliated by throwing rocks at them. There had been frequent sightings in the area in the previous few years. On to the next one. In Delaware County, in Oklahoma, this incident occurred at Jumper Cemetery. One evening in September, my friend and I were sitting at Jumper Cemetery about dark on a full moonlit night. As we were sitting there, I heard the sound that I thought was a deer walking down the ridge. I told my friend, listen, there's a deer coming down the hill. We sat there and listened as the sound made its way down the ridge from town. The west side of the cemetery has trees grown up along the fence row for about half the distance of the west side. A little further down is a platform between two huge oak trees used to place food on when they are having funerals. The sound came to the bottom of the holler on the west side of the cemetery. The cemetery is enclosed by a hog wire barbed wire fence about four feet tall. Then the sound proceeded to come up the hill between the trees along the fence row and the platform for food. As we listened to the sound, 
come towards us, we were incredulous as we saw a large, hairy, man-looking thing walk up to the fence and step over it. We watched as the animal, it stank tremendously, walked across the cemetery toward a huge tree in the middle. As it came under this tree, its head was just below its lowest branch. Apparently, at this time, it became aware of us as it turned its head and looked over its right shoulder at us. When it saw us, it didn't run, but it began to walk very fast toward the southern border of the cemetery. When it got there, it again stepped over the fence. When it got to the timber, it crashed through the tree, making a terrible racket. I looked at my friend and asked him if he saw what I had. He replied that he thought that he had. I had never mentioned this to anyone for fear of being ridiculed because not only did we see what we took to be a Bigfoot, but the one we saw was white. Some 10 years later, I was teaching at Kenwood, located in the extreme western portion of central Delaware County. We were watching a video called Legends of Ozark. This video recreated a scene that supposedly happened near Fayetteville, Arkansas. This recreation showed exactly what my friend and I had seen. Thereafter, I spoke about this incident to some of my elderly friends and relatives who have lived in the area all their lives. Some of them also admitted to having seen this beast at some point in the past, but like me, had never said anything due to the fear of being ridiculed. I know what I saw. It doesn't matter if I'm believed or not. I myself was incredulous at the time. My mind had a hard time accepting what my eyes were seeing. I can see this in my mind today, just as if it happened moments ago. The smell was terrible, and the animal was white. This was early evening between 8 and 9 p.m. on a bright moonlit night. On to the next one. In Latimer County in Oklahoma, it was dark. About 8 p.m., my two sons and I were watching television while eating popcorn. The eldest, age 16, was sitting across the room on the love seat. The youngest, age 8, was sitting next to me on the sofa. We were sharing a bowl of popcorn placed between us. I smelled this horrific stench coming from the window directly behind us. My family has teased me about having the nose of a hound. So, my 16-year-old says, Oh, Mom, you're always smelling something. Well, I look around and the smell dissipates. We continue watching television. A few minutes pass, and the stench blows in again. I got up while telling my oldest to help pull out the sofa that there is something horrible under it. As he approached, he smells the stench and says, It's a snake. The youngest moved back. We pulled the couch out and looked all over the entire room and came up with nothing. We noticed the breeze blowing the curtain and decided that whatever the source, it's outside and we'll check it out in the daylight. The 16-year-old went outside about an hour later. He came back inside for the shotgun. His dad has taken him hunting since he was six years old. He knows guns and the woods. He said someone was standing in the back, about six yards north of the house by a railroad post, watching the house, and it was one darn big guy. He took the gun and went toward our chicken pen. I heard him yell from about 50 yards or so from the chicken pen to call the law. I was scared beyond measure for my son, not knowing what was happening. I called the sheriff. After about 10 minutes, my son came back to the house. He said the guy stepped over the barbed wire fence and jumped over a brush pile while leaving. He'd not had to use the gun. Two sheriff's deputies arrived. They shined light up and down the yard and property and found nothing. My son went to his grandmother's house to inform her that we had a prowler. She lives about 40 yards northeast of us. He'd been gone about 20 minutes when I heard the metal latch of an outside storage building. Someone had gone into the building. Now, my youngest son and I were in the house. The eldest, knowing I was already spooked, would not be lurking about. His dad was out of town working, putting up a gas rig. 
the question being who had opened the latch. The building is my laundry room and contained my washer, dryer, and deep freeze. I phoned my mother-in-law and asked to speak with my son. When he answered the phone, I asked if he'd been there the whole time. The answer being yes, I told him someone had entered the laundry building and to my knowledge hadn't left. He said he would be home. After telling him to be careful, I waited and watched. He was home in two minutes. While we were discussing what to do, he yelled out, What in the bleep is that? My eight-year-old ran into the kitchen. They both had seen a face in the picture window behind the sofa. The eldest said it was dirty and hairy. I called the sheriff again. My son got the shotgun and my youngest son and myself waited behind him, sitting on the floor with the lights out. I fully expected some deranged vagabond to jump through the window. While waiting, we smelled the stench again as we were only three or four feet from the window. Then I knew the scent was coming from this person. Knowing this sent chills up my spine. The deputies arrived and again found nothing and left. I never associated this event with the Bigfoot until reading about other incidents. The stench is what ties it in for me and the description my son gave of the face in the window. The way this character acted just wasn't in keeping with anything I've ever known. But the deciding factor for me was about eight months ago. I repeated this story to a friend of ours, a retired Oklahoma highway patrolman who hunts with my husband. He said this was out of character for any perp he'd ever seen. As close as I can describe, the scent was a mix between dirty, wet, steamy blue jeans, soiled diapers, and wet, filthy dogs. That's why, for years, I thought we had a deranged or drugged-up tramp lurking about, as my husband had found the sign of someone being in the wood roundabout. While returning from the chicken pen, one evening, I felt the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I knew someone or something was there. I made myself appear casually walking back to the house. I shut the door and locked it. Another time, the doorknob was turned and would have opened were it not locked. And I and the neighbors heard strange screams and howls on occasion. My oldest son, who is 38 now, was watching television across the room and left of my location. My youngest son, who would be 30, died three years ago. And myself were eating popcorn while watching television sitting in front of the eight-foot-wide picture window containing the side-screened windows which were open. The perfect temperature, about 72 degrees. Light breeze from the north. The time was around 8 p.m. Pine, oak, blackjack, hickory, and cedar trees, lots of brush. Florsch Maline Creek flows about a quarter mile from our property. There's a pond about 100 yards away from our house, my son and a friend of his have told me about a couple of incidents. My grandson said he and a cousin have seen a Bigfoot about 13 miles east of us. On to the next one. During my summers off from college, I had a job working on a ranch where my only regular duty was to drive around and monitor the ground making sure that wild animals kept their distance from the livestock. This property was spread out across many acres, and sometimes that made it challenging work. Sometimes there would be one other guy around my age, Jamie, who would be assigned a certain section. There was this one afternoon when Jamie and I were eating lunch together that he told me about a mysterious sighting he had earlier that morning. He claimed that he saw something standing on two legs at first glimpse, thought it was a brown bear. However, he was aware that brown bears weren't native to the region. Additionally, he said its legs bent at the knees in a way that was very much like the hind legs of a dog, though he admitted that his vision of the lower body was impaired due to its standing behind the fence. If it weren't for the fact he was all the way across the field behind the opposite fence, he would have been much more intimidated. Jamie said it didn't create any noise of any kind during that initial sighting. By the time he reached for his binoculars, 
and raised them to his eyes, the strange animal was no longer there. I wasn't one of those people who would immediately shut down the possibility of strange occurrences, but back then, I had never before heard of the cryptid that people commonly refer to as Dogman. Therefore, I leaned more toward the idea that there had to be a reasonable explanation. I had sort of forgotten about the whole story until a few weeks later, when I saw something utterly peculiar running across the field, the speed of whatever the thing was. It was astonishing. Before that moment, I didn't know any living organism on the face of the earth was capable of moving at speeds like that, especially on two legs. I'm not at all certain, but if I had to estimate, I'd say it was moving at around 40 to 45 miles per hour. I couldn't make out what it was carrying, but it looked to either be prey or perhaps even its offspring. That was as far as that sighting went. The following day, I met with Jamie at lunchtime. I told him about what I saw. I have to say that it was nice to know that someone else had seen this thing. Otherwise, I think I would have had a much harder time coming to terms with it. Jamie and I both agreed that we should tell the owner as soon as possible, and we thought it would be best to do it together so that it would sound more credible. Approached the owner, Marv, we were surprised to hear from him that he had also seen that thing before. However, it had been years since he had a sighting. That was when he revealed to us that this mysterious creature was the primary reason that he started having workers patrol the grounds. He said that there were times when he would find dead livestock that nothing had taken the time to consume. He said that it was as if this thing enjoyed the act of killing and will do so even when it's not hungry. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The way he talked about it was as if he was dealing with nothing more than a pack of aggressive wolves or something. It was like he had totally accepted that there are real monsters in existence. So what's the point of getting all worked up about it? Now, this thing was back. Marv equipped us with pistols he wanted us to shoot into the air if we ever were to spot the creature again. I was never a big fan of guns, but I'll admit that it made me feel much safer. Having this thing on me while knowing what was in the area, I was so freaked out by the idea of seeing this thing close up that I was beginning to wonder whether I should ask for a raise. The speed at which I saw it move made it crystal clear that this thing was an ultimate predator. I did not doubt that it could sneak up on me at any time, and this made me paranoid, enough to where I was constantly looking in all directions. I have to say, it was pretty exhausting. If it truly did get enjoyment from the act of killing, what was to stop it from killing one of us? A couple of weeks passed without either of us spotting the mysterious creature. It wouldn't be until I heard Jamie fire off not one, but two gunshots that I knew the creature had returned. Feeling a responsibility to provide backup, I raced toward the area where I thought I heard the gunshot coming from. When I spotted Jamie, he was using his t-shirt to bandage his upper left arm. When I asked him what happened, he explained to me that he was crouched over the body of a murdered lamb and the creature came out of nowhere and took a swipe at him. He immediately fired a shot into the air, but when the creature barely budged, he fired a second shot, this time toward the creature. Although he missed, it was enough to scare the creature off. When I took a peek at the wound, I was surprised to see there were a lot thinner than I expected. He said that it was still standing several feet away from him and wasn't close enough to dig too deeply into his flesh. However, it was still enough to warrant immediate bandaging. He brought me over to where the mutilated lamb was, even though it was a bloody mess. It looked as though the creature had only taken a few bites from the corpse before it ran off. So, I suppose it didn't always kill just for fun. Maybe it heard Jamie coming and stepped out of sight before Jamie noticed it. Jamie confirmed the massive size of the creature 
and I remember him saying how he for sure thought he was going to die. He believed that if he hadn't had that pistol, there's no way he would have been there to tell me about the incident. When we went to tell Marv about it, the man was pretty shaken by what had happened to Jamie. He seemed very discouraged by it, and he got on the phone and dialed the police right in front of us, although I noticed he didn't mention anything about Jamie's injury. We watched from a distance as one police car rolled up to Marv's home. Jamie and I just sat there for a while, observing, waiting to see if anyone needed us for anything. It wasn't long before a couple more police cars rolled up behind the first one, but none of the officers ever approached any of us with questions. It was later that day that Marv informed Jamie and I that he was going to give us paid leave until further notice. Believe it or not, those paychecks kept coming until the end of summer, without either of us having to work another day. I've always wondered what went on there while we were absent. Could he have gotten the authorities involved in the mystery in the past? I never saw it with my own eyes, but Jamie told me that he once saw a heavy-duty, military-grade vehicle pull into the long road that leads into the farm. I can't imagine what else something of that large grade would have been needed for on Marv's farm. Additionally, could there have been more than one of those strange creatures residing near the property? Marv never mentioned seeing more than one of them at a time, but... He was also very vague on the subject. When we spoke about it, that seemed to me that he had a difficult time accepting that these creatures are real, regardless of how long he had known about them. I've never seen a Bigfoot or any other cryptid, but given that I know with 100% certainty that these dogmen exist, I don't doubt that there are all other sorts of weird things running around out there. On to the next one. In November, a call came across that a hunter had been found laying in a field and appeared to be dead. A woman who had let her dog loose for a run in the same field had made the discovery. My partner and I were dispatched to the scene and we knew that the police would be there as well. The location, as it was given over the radio was about 15 miles outside of town, near an area comprised of woods and farm fields. When we arrived at the scene, the police had just gotten there. The woman with her dog, who was now on a leash, was talking to the officer and pointing with her hand out into the nearby field. As we got out of the ambulance, there was a jeep parked by the edge of the field, as well as a Toyota Corolla, which we later learned belonged to the woman who found the body. The field and the adjoining tract of woodland was one of the only non-farmed areas around. Most of the surrounding area for miles and miles was used for agricultural production. As we walked out into this field, the woman was bringing us along the wood line to where the body was discovered, keeping in mind that she said she found a hunter, and when we walked upon the deceased, who we could tell was in fact dead, he was lying on his side in a very strange posture, with blood surrounding his mouth and cheeks. We took note of a rifle laying on the ground some 20 feet away from him, as well as a shooting support pole that is used to steady a rifle for long shots in the field. We also noticed a target set up on the far side of the field, which the woman hadn't seen prior. It appeared that the man had been standing on one side of the field and shooting across it, either sighting his rifle or having some target practice. What I couldn't wrap my mind around was the amount of blood that had come from his mouth and was pooled around him, soaked into the ground. His body was bent backward, so much so that he looked like the letter U while lying there. He looked like he had been folded around a stout tree, if you can wrap your mind around what I am saying. The amount of blood that had exited the victim's body before the heart stopped was indicative of a tremendous internal trauma, perhaps to multiple organs. The trauma was like that which occurs from a high-speed vehicular crash of some kind or when someone is run over by something of heavy weight. 
the man's body from, say, the waist up to the midrib area appeared to have been crushed. But the question was, by what? How does a man standing alone in a field find himself being subjected to such a hideous death? A death which was obviously not self-inflicted. He did have a rifle after all. While we were waiting for instructions from the police as to whether we were going to take the body or if it was going to become a crime scene, we casually walked around the area looking for anything else we could find, and find we did. The man's body was currently about 30 feet into the field, in reference to the wood line. However, when we walked closer to the woods, we came upon some interesting evidence. There was a spot where multiple boot prints that were the same as those that were on the victim's feet. There were also many indentations in the ground from where the shooting pole had been put down. In other words, this was where the man was actually shooting from, not from out in the field. That's when we found the most unsettling evidence. Approaching from behind, where the man had been standing, were several extremely large, bare footprints, like that of a human's, but not if you catch my drift. These were the tracks of a Bigfoot. Of that we were certain. They were at least 24 inches long and had made impressions into the soil many times deeper than those of the man's boots. After seeing these monstrous prints that had approached the shooter from the rear, we now made the presumptive leap that the creature was apparently not happy about the presence of the marksman and his firing of the rifle. Taking matters quite literally into his own hands. Having seen these newly found prints, we called the officer over, and by this time there were three of them. It's funny, and I don't mean that in a humorous way, but all of us were gathering around these footprints, the woman with the dog was attempting to come over and have a look-see for herself. Her dog, who prior to this was sniffing the body and pulling her here and there on the leash, would not go anywhere near the footprints. He started to bark, and growl, biting his leash and pulling away from the footprint. It was obvious to us that this animal wanted nothing to do with the scent of this beast. As I stood there and saw the dog's reaction, it came to mind that perhaps there was a lesson to be learned here. It was highly doubtful in my mind that this dog had ever had any contact with a Bigfoot, and yet instinctively it knew to stay away from this odor. Perhaps we too should stay away. If the marksman, who was lying dead on the ground, could rethink his actions that day, I believe with certainty that he would have chosen a different agenda for the day's activity as well. It's just a thought. On to the next one. The following are a collection of entries from A Grandfather's Journal. My grandfather worked at a mine called the Almeida. June 9th, 1922. Had some excitement at the mine today. Some of the boys had been talking about going off on their own, and finally they done it. Hope they strike it rich. Our foreman warned the rest of us not to try it, because we'd never work anywhere again. I've been thinking of going myself, but I'll wait and see if they get rich first. June 22nd, 1922. Sure glad I stayed here after all, cause the search party found Jim Lowell alive and two of the boys they couldn't recognize cause they was torn to pieces. Heads were torn off, so they buried the bodies there on the riverbank and never found the other guy. Don't know who is missing cause they couldn't tell whose body they did find. They are still working on it heard that they was attacked by ape men, and the search party said there were big, monster-sized footprints all over. Figured on talking with Jim, because they said he was coming back tomorrow. June 23rd, 1922. Jim never came back, and we had a meeting. The bosses said that nobody had better try that again. I thought maybe the bosses told us that awful story to keep us from quitting but a couple of the searchers said it was all true. On to the next one. This is a separate account of the Almeida mine disaster because there were notations about it in an old miner's journal whose descendant said also worked at the Almeida mine. 
Here it is transcribed exactly as it was written with no correction to punctuation, spelling, or grammar. First notation. We lost a party of five off the crew and some of the boys knew they were leaving. They had been planning to go off on their own and have been storing shovels, pans, picks, and food back down the river a ways. They have been gathering things each payday, and for those of us who knew they were planning to go are hoping they hit it rich. And if they do, they're going to have a lot of company. Second notation. One miner returned today, but the bosses are keeping him away from the rest of us. But word is being spread that they struck out and were working their way back when they were attacked by ape men. Word is that two giant ape men came out of the bushes and tore into these guys, hitting, tearing, and biting them. Another party set out to find them, and they had guns and could not find nobody. Third notation. Search party came back today with two backpacks. I heard that they buried two of the men that were torn up bad, and somebody said their heads were gone. That leaves two that may be floating down the river and one that lived. He quit, but most of us are hearing that the foreman took him to town, gave him his pay, and enough to travel on and kicked him out of town. I heard from one of the shift bosses that the company was trying to keep the story quiet because they was afraid everybody would quit. The barrack buildings we live in are not that secure, and they sit right next to the woods up from the river, so a horse could gallop and we wouldn't hear it. Also, the road goes just above the buildings and goes right up into the forest. Since this happened, we block the door with an iron bar to let us know when it opens. Sure was hoping to strike it rich. On to the next one. I live west of San Antonio, Texas, near Medina Lake. Today, I was on a random outing to the area near the Diversion Lake Dam. At about 7.30 p.m., I was on my way back up the trail when I suddenly heard a loud, awful scream coming from below the dam downstream. It sounded like an owl, but lasted longer and was much louder. I stopped walking and watched the downstream to see if I could catch a look at what caused the sound. I then noticed a large flock of birds flushed out of the trees near the riverbank. Then, suddenly, this giant flying creature swooped down into the river valley and just as quickly flew back up into the rocks. I continued to watch, but did not hear or see it again. I call it a creature because it looked nothing like a bird. I was about 50 yards from it, and would say conservatively that its wingspan was 15 feet or so. It was dark colored and had a very long beak and a strange long thin tail. This sounds crazy, but it actually resembled one of those flying dinosaurs, though the head was not as large and it looked like it had feathers. I got back home and looked on the internet for examples of bird species but found nothing close. I'm not originally from this area and have never heard of anything like this. These creatures were so huge, they looked like the size of small planes. On to the next one. I have seen many things in my life. Some are scary and some are mystical. I was walking through the woods in Westerville, Ohio. The woods I had walked through a thousand times. It was getting late. Sun was going down, so I was heading back home across our 33 acres. I heard a twig snap in the woods behind me, so I turned around to see what I thought would be a deer, a fox, or maybe a rabbit. I looked through the trees and saw a large, hairy figure standing next to a tree. It was also staring at me. We both stood there, eyes locked for around ten minutes, neither one of us moving. I've watched a lot of TV as a kid, so I knew exactly what I was looking at. 
he stood there, around eight feet tall, reddish brown hair from head to toe, and the build of a linebacker or a bodybuilder. This was my first encounter with a Sasquatch or Bigfoot. At first, I was intrigued, but also scared of Frozen. But we just stared into each other's eyes, neither one of us making any movement. He was probably just as curious of me as I was of him. Finally, after some time had passed, I became unfrozen and made a break for home. I ran as fast as I could, and I never looked back. I was 10 years old then. A week later, the newspaper had this headline on the front page, Bigfoot in Ohio. I knew then that I wasn't the only one to see him. On to the next one. This is a story about the one that got away, or maybe we did. My daughter likes to run 24-hour relays on a team. This one was local, and she was already familiar with most of the legs she would run. But there was a six-mile stretch in the mountains. We live in the Tetons, Yellowstone area. This was in a very remote area. I drove her up to where her leg would start. She would run and I would leapfrog ahead and check on her and give her a drink, stuff like that. All went well until the last half mile stretch. All of a sudden, I was overcome with a feeling of fear and doom, darkness and panic. I couldn't identify the source but every cell in my body screamed to get out of there. I was still behind Lila, so I drove up to catch her and found her sobbing and in a complete state of panic, but she didn't know why either. She said she knew something was really wrong and was terrified, but didn't know what and had been praying for me to pick her up. She scrambled into the car and we got out of there as fast as we could. I always thought there must have been a mother moose or a grizzly close and we were being warned away. But since my grandson saw a Bigfoot only 60 miles from there, I wonder if it was something else. I don't know of any dogman sightings locally. There was definitely something dangerous there that we were warned away from somehow. It was the most scared I've ever been in my life. On to the next one. So, when my parents were newlywed, my dad is asleep in bed. My mom, also in bed, but awake watching TV. My mom wakes my dad, saying she heard noises, what sounded like someone dragging chains along the house. So, my dad, thinking he's invincible, takes his thirty-eight pistol and walks outside in his underwear and walks the complete perimeter of the house, and he saw nothing, but he said the whole time he felt like something was watching him. The next day, there was a story in the paper about a neighbor who lived just houses down from them who saw a huge figure staring at her through her window above her front door. She said it had glowing red eyes. The window it was peeking through was over seven feet tall, both my parents are positive what they heard was a Bigfoot. On to the next one. I don't typically share my experiences. In this particular case, I will talk about it. Bigfoot. Yeah, I'm a believer due to a few experiences I had in an area that I will not disclose. I ran into an absolute collage of large impressions near a ridge in October during rifle hunt. I told my father and showed him. My father laughed at me and dismissed it. The next year, same time, hunt, and general area. I experienced a sense of cognitive dislocation. I got lost in an area I had heavily hunted for a decade and ran into three large, dark, furry or more so long-haired bipedals. There was no stench and these creatures froze up when I walked up on them. 
I examined the situation for approximately three minutes and then backed away slowly back up the ridge. At the time, I was still disoriented, so I began to look for landmarks I knew. I found some, met up with my father, and we left without being saying a word. I was treated so poorly the year before, it seemed pointless to me. Fast forward to today. My father experienced other phenomena that I've also experienced since I was six within our own household, and he now believes. Oddly enough, I've become slightly skeptical over time. I know what I've seen over the years. How to define it is another battle. On to the next one. Living in central Louisiana, my brother-in-law used to take me out looking for arrowheads out in the woods, creeks, and new clear cuts, especially after a rain. Sometimes we would find one or two, most times just broken ones or chips of flint. We went out during my Christmas break from school. Him and I went to this very large clear cut that bordered a creek. We were out there after a huge rain. The creek was to the top of its banks, and we had both done well in the arrowhead department. As we got to the back of the area near the creek, we noticed a horrible smell. A mix of garbage, body odor, and wet dog. The smell kept getting worse. We just figured something got caught in the Cretan, drowned, and was rotting. We were down by that edge of the water, looking for anything flint, when we heard a crunching noise like sticks breaking. We both looked up to the top of the hill, and this red, brown, hairy man thing was looking back at us. We froze. It didn't. It took a few more steps toward us. We could see its full height and its size. It was at best estimate from my brother-in-law that it was eight to nine feet tall, probably almost 400 pounds. The temperature was in the upper 30s, so we decided to swim across the creek to get away from it. It came to the water's edge, watched us, and then walked back at an angle away from us back up the hill. We sat freezing for about two hours to be sure it was gone. We swam back across and got out of there. Of course, no one believed us, so we stopped telling the story. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!